One of the things that I think is particularly appealing or ought to be particularly appealing about this novel for St. John's College students is Jane Austen's attention to the conversation as the fundamental unit of social engagement. Um, and she thinks deeply about how we build a social space out of our conversations with each other and how we position ourselves relative to another person in how we engage them in conversation. And so, and so turning out, it turns out that being a bad conversationalist can actually signal some very worrying things about you. So this passage comes from sort of midway through the novel. Elizabeth Bennet has gone to visit her childhood friend, Charlotte Lucas, who's married the odious Mr. Collins. And they've been invited to dinner at Rosings Park, which is the home of the illustrious Lady Catherine de Bourgh. And after dinner, they sit down to play cards and hopefully to have a little conversation. Elizabeth's table, it turns out to be very dry. No one is talking. So she starts to pay attention to the table next to her. A great deal more passed at the other table. Lady Catherine was generally speaking, stating the mistakes of the three others or relating some anecdote of herself. Mr. Collins was employed in agreeing to everything her ladyship said, thanking her for every fish he won and apologizing if he thought he had won too many. Sir William did not say much. He was storing his memory with anecdotes and noble names. Um, so this passage obviously represents a failed conversation, um, but I think it raises the question of what is required in order for deep and meaningful conversation to take place. Well, I think it's not a coincidence that Austin sets us up in a card game here, because I think a conversation like a game of cards requires that we agree to a common set of norms and that those norms apply to everyone equally. And that means that as participants in a conversation, we have to hold some facts about the world outside at a distance. We have to leave them at the door. Um, and in order to sort of turn inwards and, and do the serious work of having a conversation with another person. And that idea of a conversation as a hallowed, internally constructed space is so much of a piece with the St. John's College uh, practice, um, in, in my view. And I think it's why we, for instance, all address each other with the same honorifics at the table, because we leave so much at the door when we come in to do the work of conversation. Um, that's precisely the kind of thing that can't take place at this card table. Far from thinking that the social world is being renewed or sustained in, uh, by conversation with other people, instead the, the outside social world is coming in through the windows and pushing on this conversation and deforming it in all these strange and, and funny ways. Uh, we see these two male figures, Mr. Collins and Sir William, almost erase themselves from existence. Mr. Collins becomes nothing but a mirror to Lady Catherine, affirming everything that she says. And Sir William, um, nothing but a sponge. He's just absorbing her anecdotes. And, and he, I think, is possibly the most socially anxious figure here. He's a newly minted aristocrat. And we can see how he's sort of planning to become himself a Lady Catherine de Bourgh in some future conversation, having absorbed these anecdotes. And he'll be able to occupy that position in front of his own social inferiors. So the cycle will, will continue. I think the next passage that I, I'd like to look at draws our attention to something which I, I think is very important and very true which is um, that the novel, I think, is the best piece of technology we've produced for looking at our everyday lives and for investigating the lives of other people. And so this passage comes when uh, Jane and Elizabeth, it's a little bit earlier in the novel, are um, returning to Longbourn, their family home, after a protracted stay at Netherfield Park, which is the residence of the Bingleys. And these are the two eldest of the Bennett sisters, and they encounter their three youngest sisters, Mary, the somewhat ornery, dry moralist, and Catherine and Lydia, or Kitty and Lydia, who are these two incorrigible flirts. They found Mary, as usual, deep in the study of the thorough base and human nature, and had some new extracts to admire, and some new observations of threadbare morality to listen to. Catherine and Lydia had information for them of a different sort. Much had been done, and much had been said in the regiment since the preceding Wednesday. Several of the officers had dined lately with their uncle, a private had been flogged, and it had actually been hinted at that Colonel Forster was going to be married. So, there are two things that I want to attend to here. The first is this description of Mary, we learn something about Mary. We learn about how she reads. So Mary reads the great books 
And then she cherry picks her favorite parts and she excerpts them, which is a very common 19th century practice actually to make sort of excerpted commonplace books. Um, and then she uses her excerpts to sort of wield moral advice at other people. Then I want to pay attention to Catherine and Lydia's report, which we get in the form of this list. Several of the officers had dined lately with their uncle, a private had been flogged, and it had actually been hinted that Colonel For Forster was going to be married. Um, so we get this list, and Jane Austen, like any great comedian, knows about the rule of threes. Um, three things put together is always a sort of good comic structure, but buried in the middle of this list is this kind of horrific event. Um, a private has been flogged. Uh, a man, a soldier in the local militia, has been publicly whipped for some kind of offense. A public flogging is a horrific thing um, of the kind that seems to have no place in a Jane Austen novel, and yet here it is. Um, so why? Um, well, at first, I want to note that we've moved from Mary's moral excerpting to a seemingly morally indifferent schema, the list. Um, it's, I think, a little bit jarring to encounter these three things next to each other as though they all hang together in some coherent way, or as though our attention to each of them should be identical. Uh, they're all just news, um, pure entertainment, which, of course, it is if you're just operating in the realm of rapacious gossip. Uh, flogging is interesting in the same way that dinner party conversation is interesting. Um, so there's a way in which that's very disturbing to us, I think. There's also a way, though, in which that um, combination and that adjacency between a marriage announcement and this kind of violence was very much a part of Jane Austen's life. Um, this novel is written in and situated in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars, um, which posed an existential threat to Britain and which led to sort of untold casualties overseas. And it's something that the novel is obviously engaged with because every third man in this text is either a captain or a colonel or something like that, and the militia is in town. Um, so I think it's important to remember that Austen is a wartime novelist, and it's something that scholarship has only recently started to really sort of suss out how is that actually shaping her, her imagination. In a very real way, this novel, which seems to be about dinner parties and marriage announcements, um, and where the most worrying moral situation is the possibility of an elopement, um, is rimmed around by very real and very brutal violence. And every so often, Austin just lets us catch a glimpse of it, um, just in the corner of our eye. But if you blink, you'll miss it. And that actually seems to be a really important part of how the novel is working, too. The formulation of our attention here seems to me to be related to how this novel is operating as a kind of site of our moral instruction. That instance, when you're reading along, and then you pause and you say, a private has been flogged, um, that's a moment when your habits of reading and your habits of attending have been disrupted. And I think you become activated as a more moral kind of reader. Um, and that's, I think, the way that we have to attend to things in Austin. You have to be so careful so that you can catch these weighty silences or these really brief glimpses of something deeper that's going on in the text. 